Uh, my name is Zach Hill. I'm the plant records specialist and taxonomist here at Juniper Little Botanic Garden and Plant Delights Nursery. Uh, we're going to talk about ferns this morning. We've got one of the largest fern collections of hardy ferns anywhere in North America. Um, we will become the one of the eastern display gardens for the Hardy Fern Foundation uh, and the American, I think, American Fern Society as well. So we've we've worked with. It's a mainly West Coast operation, but we actually have a huge collection of ferns. So we're going to go look at some ferns. So this big mass of ferns, this is um, Adiantum capillus veneris Bermuda run. It's one of Tony's collections from Bermuda, um, which you wouldn't think would be hardy here, but <laughs> it's incredibly hardy. Um, this is one we sell. Uh, it's mostly evergreen. It does go to the ground if we get in the teens. Um, but it comes, oh yeah, it comes right back. This, this clump is, um, had it here for 21 years, oh, wow. so it, it spreads. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it spreads slowly. Um, it's not terribly yeah. invasive, and you know things come up through it. We've got the um, double um, foam uh, bloodroot here, and some rhodias that just sort of come up through it, and it it pairs well with other good ferns, other things like Ethereum neponicum cultivars, the Japanese painted ferns. So we've got, you can mix and match ferns. Uh, and this actually does get some sun during the day. So it's not all always in shade. It's, they can take some sun as well with moisture. Yes, ma'am. Ferns in my back area that's very shaded, and there's it seems like the quality of the soil is very poor. And they the next year they come back tiny and either go completely away. So, you do want a, a fairly rich soil with moisture for most ferns. This one grows in masonry cracks in the walls around Wilmington, mm -hmm. Charleston. Uh, okay. It, 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 it will actually come up in the bricks. This is one of the species that will do that uh, along with Terrace Fatata, which is on the other side of the house. Um, that they're actually, they grow in walls and they spore themselves in. And I think Patrick had mentioned the genetics on this one actually was based out of, it was the same material that is in Charleston that came from somewhere in the Caribbean originally that moved around during colonial times via ships and it sort of made its way <laughs> unknowingly to other other locations uh, so so this fern this is Christmas fern uh, Polysticum acrosticoides it is a native an eastern North American native uh, it's native in Wake County in any dry wood, dry to wet woods, anywhere. It's normally in shade, but this is obviously growing in almost full sun all day long. And it, it's a little, it's got its fertile bits at the tips of some of the fronds, and that's what's a little burnt, but it is evergreen and will make it through any winter North Carolina can throw at it, throw at it be it on the coast or five, six thousand feet up in the mountains in North Carolina. So. Uh, let's see. We're going to head over here. So this is, this is a cool little native fern. This is um, bulblet fern. It's Cystopterus bulbifera. This one came from East uh, Western Virginia. Um, it's called bulblet fern because it forms these little uh, plantlets that, uh, that fall off and <laughs> and form new ferns. So it's it clones itself effectively. Um, and it, this started out. This was collected in 2013. 
um, as just a, some bublets off the off of a plant, um, and then it's formed this giant mass of fern, but not overly aggressively done. But it's a cool little native fern. Um, it's deciduous. It will go completely dormant in the winter. Um, we have another one of the wall ferns is Terrace cretica. This this is one that will come up in in the masonry like the Adiantum capillus veneris. Um, this is a Chinese collection, uh, Ping Wu. Uh, it's mostly evergreen. Uh, hard winters will knock it to the ground, but it's it's a good and it's a good fern. It will form nice large clumps over time. So go giant fern is Dryopteris celsa. This is log fern. This is a native. This one was um, along the Savannah River in Georgia. Uh, this grew with Taxodium and a uh, bald cypress swamp. This was acres and acres. Um, 2017, Jeremy Schmidt, our head of research at the moment, and I went looking at trilliums. <laughs> we stopped at this this swamp on the side of the road and we walked in and it was acres and acres of this fern we took a small division off of them and then that fall they clear cut the entire swamp oh my god and this oh. this really beautiful you could smell it smelled like fern in there this is a mostly evergreen species the the fronds will fall down in the winter um, but luckily we collected a little piece of it out of the tens of thousands of plants that were there and we will eventually re release this one it's called mckinney this is the cultivar um, but this is a six-year-old clump at this point it's you know four to five feet across and four feet tall it's a great native, durable, it takes average soil to fairly wet soil. Um, it's, it's, I can't say enough good things about this fern. If you're looking for a fern that will take average soil to, to dry, sun to shade. So. so other ferns that, that propagate themselves for you are things like this uh, Woodwardia unigemata. This is uh, Ping Wu, a Chinese collection. So, I mean, it's, it's a huge fern. It's unigemata, it creates one gemma. It's a baby plant that will eventually turn out like golf ball sized, that will touch down and root and move itself on. We, we don't let it do that because we try to collect them to propagate them for nursery. Um, we've offered this in the past. Um, it's a, a really interesting evergreen fern from China. And beside it is Diplasium maximum. This is, an, this is a small uh, deciduous fern from China as well. It, this is a small one. It can get like six, six to seven feet tall eventually. Uh, but we've tried, we've offered these in the past as well. This is an upside down fern. It's from Mount Dyson. I believe this is Korean genetics. We did offer this this year. I don't think, I think we're sold out at the moment, but it's, it's upside down fern because if you look at it, it looks like the frond is actually upside down, but it actually is right side up. Um, but this is Arachniotes standishii, Mount Dyson. Uh, this is one, it's tardily deciduous again. It's gonna keep its leaves till the mid-teens. And then they start to look a little ratty and then you can just chop them off. It forms really large clumps. They get about two to three feet high um, over time. It's perfectly hardy. I think this is like a zone six, maybe even zone five. So it's, it's, it's actually more cold tolerant than it looks because it, it gives a nice tropical look to it. Another 
another genus of ferns that that we grow is Dryopteris. It's the same with the log fern. This is Dryopteris kinkiensis from China. It's a nice evergreen fern. We actually are selling this right now. Um, it gets about three feet tall, three, three and a half feet tall. It's evergreen. It's got a good texture to it. Um, it's just an interesting, interestingly named fern. It's from uh, the Kinki Peninsula in Japan, but it's also in China. Um, and we call it something like the Kinki Wood Fern, because <laughs> why not? Uh, so another maiden hair, this is Adiantum uh, fimbriatum. This is similar to like Adiantum venustum and Davidii. This is a one we haven't released yet. This came from some Chinese genetics. Um, that this this plant was planted here uh, six years ago as a little small clump and it's spread to what six six feet wide about four feet uh, we will be offering this in the future it's one that's another mostly evergreen species but it's it does really well for us uh, not all ferns are shade plants uh, this is uh, Myriopterus aurea, it, also known as Chylanthes banariensis. Um, this is an evergreen dryland fern. This is one from Arizona. It's, it will go to the ground at, at about 10 degrees. We will be offering this eventually. It's a really cool drought tolerant fern that takes, takes average moisture i mean it's perfectly fine for us here mm. but and it never really gets to be invasive it's a nice tight clumping plant um, another dryopterus that takes some sun is dryopterus tokyoensis this is uh from japan as well as china it gets about three feet maybe three and a half feet tall uh, it and then the fronds lay down in the winter, much like all the other Dryopteris that are ever evergreen. This guy or the fern? This is another Cystopteris. Uh, this is a cousin to the bulblet fern we saw earlier. This we're actually selling. This is Cystopteris protrusa. It's um, another one of the um, bulblet fern genus. Um, I can't remember the common name on that one but that forms large clumps over time. Uh, if you look behind you, we have uh, Anicium japonicum. This one is filigran. It's one of the cat's claw ferns. It has really, really dissected fronds that are very finely textured. This, this is deciduous uh, at about 10 to 15 degrees again and runs but it also we get a good amount of sun on this throughout the year how old is this one this one uh we've had this in the ground uh since 2008 so this is 15 years old and it's a nice mass this is a splenium trichomenes subspecies quadrivalens it's from crimea um over um, adjacent to Russia at the moment. This is a, a rock fern that we've got actually two of them here. This one, they're two years old and we got these from a friend in Russia who has given us ferns or sent us fern spore. And we've actually found things that should not, yeah, and there's another one here. Yeah, um, things that shouldn't grow here in North Carolina <laughs> from uh, actually some really cold places in far eastern Russia, north of uh, Japan um, on the like Kamchatka Peninsula. We've got several woodsias that have done remarkably well from Primorsky that it's February and they start putting out new growth. As soon as it sort of warms up, they think, oh, it's plenty warm here 
it's time to grow. And we're like, oh, it's gonna, we're gonna have a freeze this weekend. And it's like, oh, I don't care. And it fully leaves out and does amazing. All right, this, this is a, an asplenium. It's a spleenwort. It's the same genus as that. This is a uh, splenium scolopendrium. This is a crested form that generally don't like it here. This, this may be, <laughs> uh, this is uh, the cultivar keratoides. The, uh, the British are absolutely amazed with these crested forms and they grow dozens of them and have for centuries. Uh, they like crested asplenium scolopendriums. They like crested lady ferns. And we actually have offered uh, Frizzellier and Fieldier, which were old British cultivars of crested lady ferns. And another, this is a hybrid uh, polypodium, um, Mantonier. This is a European hybrid that we're trialing out here in our crevice garden. Uh, in full sun and it's doing amazing. This has only been in about a year and a half, so. So not all ferns are, are sort of dissected. We have some that, that are just single leaves. This is Neoleposaurus fortunii, green ribbons and it has undivided leaves and this is also evergreen as well. So it's, it's formed a nice clump. Above it, we have um, Perosia petiolosa. It's one of the cultivars of Taste of China. It's a, a seedling of it. Uh, we are selling this. It's a tongue fern that grows in shade or sun and it's from, this is a Chinese collection, but it's hardy to like zone five in Denver as, a, as an epiphyte, as a little round leaf fern. We'll go. Uh, this, this is a Chylanthes ecloniana, Naughty's Neck from South Africa. This is one of um, Tony's collections. It's evergreen. This is one of the only ones that's been hardy for us here. Uh, Tony went to South Africa, I think in like 2008 or five or six, he went years ago. Uh, but this is one of his selections. It's evergreen. So we take, we cut it back in about March uh, because it sends up new fronds and obviously it's sending up new fronds now. Uh, but this is from Naughty's Neck is a pass in the mountains in South Africa. And that's where that one originated from. Yeah, it's, it's, they're, they're that blue gray sun fern. They're fuzzy and they're covered in all these reddish brown hairs. And that's where their spores are, are in the, on the backs of the foliage. Uh, it's a seven B it's, it's, it's marginal for us. It took 11 fine this year, but most of the other, um, Eclonianas have not been hardy for us. This is the only one that's done yeah. well for us. Let's see. Another sun fern is um, Astrolepis sinuata. It's a cloak fern. It's a it's a cousin to the Chylanthes. Uh, this is native to Texas, New Mexico, Arizona. Amazingly enough. Um, in the movie Deliverance, you see them blasting a big wall at the beginning. It's a lake in South Carolina. This plant showed up on these rock walls that, that are a thousand miles away from the nearest population. This fern managed to spore itself in on its own <laughs> in upstate South Carolina at this lake. Bomeria is also there, another dryland fern. There are three or four taxa that just showed up in these man-made cracks in the rock. So life finds a way. And here's another dryland fern. This is uh, Chylanthes wootonii. This is a little short um, lip fern. 
from Arizona and and it just grows in the cracks of the rocks and you know not all ferns want wet too much wet will absolutely kill that plant so it's it's running through the cracks and it's we planted one little piece and it went along the crack and climbed up the hill and it's absolutely happy this is unirrigated and completely dry this is Kylanthes Findleri. It's another western fern. This one came from Globe, Arizona. It's, we named it Globe Trotter. We will have eventually offer it, but it, it's another evergreen dryland fern. Uh, above here is Microlepia strigosa crispa. It's related to the hay-scented ferns, which are all over the mountains in North Carolina. This is a, an Asian species. Um, this is a very dissected form and it gets about half a day sun there and a little bit of shade from the, the U above it. Is Onoclea sensibilis. It's a sensitive fern. It's native to low wet woods all around the Carolinas. It has two different frond types. This was last year's fertile frond. This is what you see all the time in the woods. This is the sterile um, frond type. Uh, this is one we grow in full sun in goat trials. Uh, it's a, it likes wet. If you have really poor soil, it will grow for you in really wet, mucky soil but it's a good native fern. Is there a best time of the year to actually plant ferns? Is there um, a They're good anytime really. As long midsummer is probably not great. Yeah. You'll have to water them a lot. But I mean, the, if they're, some of them, if they're dormant, that's great. Okay. Then they'll establish pretty well, yeah. but okay. As long as you keep them adequately watered anytime. So, any other questions? No? All right. We, we don't. We have some deer fence around, but um, they do come in. So they can't come in and yeah. they like ferns? They don't go after our ferns as much as they go after our hostas and hydrangeas. Um, they do like to eat plants, <laughs> but... Thank you. Do, you. do you generally cut them back, or do you just cut the prawns, yeah. you know, in the spring, we, the prawns that have gone down in the winter? It depends on the species. Mm -hmm. uh, things like uh, Dryopteris ciboldii, which is a Dryopteris that only has single un, undivided pinnae, okay. leaflets. Um, that one, if you cut it back before it started to reflush, you can kill the plant because it actually likes to photosynthesize using those old fronds. Okay. Others are less picky. That one's just particularly a whiny little plant. Um, other droppers, we usually cut them back about March, okay. especially the semi evergreen to evergreen ones. Um, they definitely, we cut them back right before when we're doing spring cleanup for like epimediums and things like that, we cut the ferns back. Okay. But that we just them so um, let's see if I have a dryopteris. Uh, there has they have a crown mm -hmm. right. where the new fronds, the fiddleheads, come out from the center. You don't want to cut it off. You don't want to cut that crown off. Mm -hmm. You just cut out around it. Just cut the the petioles down close to the base. Mm -hmm. Um, because yeah, that would be bad because if you cut, if you cut the growth tip off, you're going to kill the plant. So any other questions? Ferns are cool. Um, they're really fun to key out in like Florida, China. It's not fun. It's we, Patrick McMillan and I, the, the director here spent a lot of time last season keying out all of our spas and even the ones that we that we got with a certain name turned out to not actually be that species but is somebody else so 
we we try to make sure that all of our ferns are true to type when we sell them to you guys um, and because one of our missions is to have things correctly named here um, that's a huge part of my job is maintaining the database and maintaining correct names on all of our taxa here i mean we have 28 thousand taxa active in the garden right now this is a dumb question but what makes a fern fern does it have to so have so yeah a fern is a primitive vascular plant they reproduce um, via spore it's they have alternation of generations now i'm going back on my botany class that were 20 years ago mm -hmm. um the spores are their sexual stage of their life so what you see these are they they're non-sexual the genetics um they have gametophytes there when you when they the spore hit the ground they germinate they they look they're these round or kidney shaped um gametophytes they have both male and female parts uh it takes water to land on them for the, to release their sperm and the eggs and then they sort of mingle together and form a new baby fern that's now you know back to the other generation um, it's a uh, ferns don't flower they have vascular systems so so plants so conifers are gymnosperms naked seeds um, most of the plants we see are either monocots or dicots. It depends on how many seed leaves they have. Um, mosses are non-vascular. They are primitive plants that don't have a vein system. So ferns have veins. And this is the, the veins that carry water and nutrients up and down in the ferns. Um, all vascular plants have some sort of vein system but ferns are on the more primitive side of things they never all all of that the the sex parts that happen outside of the fern all happen inside the flowers of all the other plants so it's their alternation of generations happens inside the seed and the ovary. You don't actually, it doesn't need water and outside help. So when you propagate the cell, is it mostly through division or can you? Uh, we, do, we do division and spore. It just depends on the taxa. Um, some of, if it's something that doesn't come true, like um, some of the patented, forms of Ethereum Neponicum, mm -hmm. uh, we do, they are division only or we buy in the liners. Um, other things that if we just sell a straight species of something, we grow it from spore on some of these on Acleas, Texas Tooth Tall uh, and Supersize, we do those clonally from division. Um, but the Chylanthes we grow from spore and generally they come true to type, so. It's, it's a, a long process. It takes us a couple years to go from spore to sellable plant, at least. So. Well, you're welcome.